Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here and to Evolver and all of our friends for being in such honor of this work, which has absolutely been the greatest gift of my life and of my family's life. And um, I begin tonight with a story of the first time that I purged. And it took me a while because my ego was so afraid to do that nasty thing in front of other people that it took me at least a half a dozen times before I finally let go of that. And as I got into the third or fourth ceremony, it actually became more frightening to me because I started to really question what was it that I was hiding from. And so as this prolonged, I started to make up stories that, well, perhaps I had done enough inner work and I just, I won't go there. <laughs> I was wrong. So the, the night that it happened was a pretty intense night for me. And I'd been holding on and fighting, as any of you who've done the work and been in ceremony, you know exactly what I'm meaning, those nights when you just can't let it go and you know that before the good stuff starts, before the master teachings will come through you that something has to be cleansed from the circuitry of your body. And it was that night for me, like I could no longer hide from whatever it was that I was hiding from. And so finally I decided that I must retreat to the restroom where I remained for five hours and dealing with what I now know is the serpent in the world of the serpent, the dark and slippery, mysterious world of the serpent. And at one point, while I was struggling in this room that became a cockpit of some sort as I was flying through all of the inner worlds, I was asked by the voices, the voice, to get up and look at myself in the mirror. And I did not like what I saw. Not only was I freakishly shape-shifting before my eyes, but I could not look into my own eyes. And I knew that I was actually being confronted with something very, very deep that if I could get over that, something new would open up for me in my life. But I could not look into my own pupil. I could glance at it, but I would glance away just as fast or I was bopping back and forth between both eyes. So I was hiding from myself. And when I asked deep for the first time, I was reaching a point where I was really surrendering for the first time. Show me, please. Show me, please. Show me, please. Oh, show me, please. And the grandmother, the spirit of the vine, said, I've just been waiting for you to ask me to help you, which was such a difficult thing for me to do. I'd always depended upon myself and had made up a story within myself that I was the only one that I could depend upon. So asking for help from another was a very difficult thing for me to do. And I finally said, okay, help me, help me. And I couldn't get the word grandmother out because I realized that I had such a judgment about the word grandmother because I did not have a close relationship with my own grandmother. I loved her and always wanted a relationship with her, but because I reminded her of my father who never married my mother and had the same eyes, she was always very indifferent with me and never let me into her world. And so to ask help for the grandmother was very difficult for me. When I finally got the words out, I burst into tears. And she kept guiding me to make it even more juvenile, even more innocent. Help me, Grandma. Help me, Grandma. Help me, please help me. Show me, show me. What is it that I'm so afraid to see? What is it that keeps creeping back in my life and destroying relationships and creating this ebb and flow experience of life is good, life is wonderful, life is 
not good, life is not wonderful, I love me, I don't love me. Everything's okay, everything's not okay. What is this, what is causing this? And she said, open your eyes, it's time to see yourself. And I did, I did the best I could. And she said, my son, my beloved son, we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for you for so long, loving you. Patiently holding you. And as the spirit of the grandmother became present to me in a way that I'd never witnessed before, I was shown and was taught. I had seen for the first time how I had been in violation of the Divine Feminine. Mm. Mm. I was in a band, which was an excuse that worked for many years. I was in a band. And this, the moment I got who I had been and how I'd violated my own mother, my mother that was my best friend, my mother who raised me as a single mother and my two sisters and my gay brother, all that feminine influence. How I'd been in violation of my own family by the choices that I had made in my addiction to seeking pleasure of the body. And that's when the serpent surfaced in the form of black, filthy sludge spewing from my body for four hours. I had no idea where it was coming from, what it was, but I knew it had to exit my body. The tongue of the serpent came out of my face and I tried to bite it off and I couldn't bite through it. It was me and it was a serpent, it was a snake that I'd become. It was the pattern that I'd been stuck in as a man trying to be like other men and conquer and, and it was clearly no longer going to be allowed to operate within this body. And this was the night that I had to deal with it or die. And to deal with it by dying. As I laid there on the floor in this little bathroom, which became my temple, I was so clear that this little space, this little tiny space, was a sacred temple. It was a time machine. It was the place where I would rebir be rebirthed. It was a womb. And I laid there on this little circular red carpet for four more hours as the Divine Mother like a Rolodex, flipped faces before me, one after another. From my mid-teens on, all of these beautiful faces of girls that I didn't even remember the names, but I would remember some essence of them. And then I would deal with the shame and the guilt and the pain that I'd caused them. And I had to feel it. I had to be with the realization that they found some kind of solace in me because I was, I've always been a nice guy. And some kind of comfort in my embrace, some kind of warmth perhaps that they didn't receive from their father that I brought them in and made them feel safe until I got what I want and somehow justified leaving them. And as I dealt with this all night long, the weight of it was just enormous. The weight of it was more than my body could handle in the moment, and I would just get back to the toilet, and I would just let it loose, and it was just darker and filthier and more painful as it went. And then the image of my former wife appeared before me. And it was interesting to me because I had 
you know, up until that point, I've been apologizing, just apologizing deeply to all of the forms of the divine feminine that I had disgraced and dishonored in my own way. And then when the image of my former wife, which we'll call Bubbles, appeared before me, suddenly my heart closed down and I said, I, 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 don't, I don't understand. I, I've done all the forgiving and work with her and we're cool, we don't really talk, but it's all, it's all good this way. And I've done all the work and, and, I, and, uh, and I've totally forgiven her. And they had, me, they had me examine that really and realize that we had just reached a point in our relationship where we could kind of tolerate each other and hear each other's names without having all of the pain resurfaced. But the truth of the matter was, I carried a lot of resentment. Got married at 23 years old and stayed in the relationship for 15 years. And I'd made up a story that she had a chemical imbalance and she was incredibly jealous and insecure. And so ultimately I was very upset at myself for allowing her to waste my time, all of those precious, valuable years that I could not get back, all of the times that we spent in counseling and working it out and talking all night long and doing everything I could just to try and make her feel loved. And I said, I can't even go there because I've already forgiven her and she's already forgiven me, I'm, I'm really good. And then the guidance said to me, are you ready to go beyond forgiveness? And I said, I don't even know what that looks like. And I said, that's what will take you there. And they proceeded to show me the overview, the big picture of my life. And they said, just follow us along. This is just a metaphor, but it will help you understand something that you can't see, you have not seen so far. And they said, please consider that before you were the body, in the body that you are right now, when you had the impulse as the consciousness that is the essence that fills the body, to come into physical form, you chose that time, point, and space on this planet to come into this game, this very important critical time on the planet where the human family would be going through a massive shift of consciousness. And we know that when that kind of a choice is made that we must send into your realm master teachers. Master teachers, people that are going to push you beyond your comfort zone into learning and stepping into a realm of consciousness that may not be the collective norm that you would not do on your own. And so we put the word out for someone, the essence of someone that could come into physical form that would agree to endure 15 years of pain and jealousy and suffering for you. And I, in a moment, went from all the blame and shame and guilt and everything that I had been carrying that time to a great deal of, a great deal of gratitude. An extremely profound sense of gratitude for every moment that I had shared with my former wife. I could reconnect with who we were as friends and how we grew up together and experience all of the challenges that she provided for me and then turn it around and to see my own righteousness, to see how I created it all. And she was just simply acting on behalf of what I was calling into my reality. And I was so for the first time in my life, truly humbled by the presence and the possibility to love myself. Because I'd realized up until that point, because everything that I had done, I'd really kept out the presence of love. Every time her mother would say, oh, mijo, you're so amazing. I love you, son. 
in the back of my mind because I know the things that I had done behind my wife's back. I would say, if you only knew, Mom, to myself, so I could not receive that love. And it was time for me to, to move past that. And I looked into my eyes in a, in a way that I had never looked into my eyes before. I looked deeply into my spirit, deeply into my soul. I saw the possibility of my future. I saw the commitments and the vows that would guide the rest of my life. I saw the possibility of new marriage. I saw the possibility of loyalty and honor and integrity and family and true love and all of the things that had closed my heart because of all of my actions. And I looked at myself and tears were streaming down my face and I felt like I'd been rebirthed in this womb. And I said, thank you. Deeply, hysterically actually at the moment, I said, thank you. Oh, thank you, grandmother. Thank you, grandma. Thank you, great spirit. And I said, thank you, God, in a way that I'd never said thank you, God, before. And then she spoke to me again. She said, don't forget to thank Ikea. And I said, the furniture store? And she said, the furniture store. And I said, okay, you lost me now. Wait. I don't get it. Why am I going to thank Ikea? And she says, what do you think about Ikea? And I said, I, honestly, she said, that's the only game we play. And I said, I think it's the most soulless assembly line crap on the planet. And she said, yes. <laughs> when you can see the sacredness and the God in all of that stuff, then you'll be truly free. And that stuff is made by people. And God is in everything. In everywhere at all times. And we are. The spirit is in everything. It's all infused with life if you just allow yourself the ability to see it. Open your eyes. And I opened my eyes and the entire bathroom was illuminated. Totally illuminated. The towel rack the toilet paper holder, <laughs> the curtains and the rings and the little red carpet that I had been on, all purchased at Ikea. <laughs> and then I started to think about the word Ikea. I said, I, the great I am. Key, as in chi, energy. <laughs> Ah, the first vowel sound of the greatest symbolic word in the Aum! Ikea! God. I've never walked through the maze of Ikea the same way since. <laughs>